So it is uh, May 21st, 2017. Today's message is called, When Prayer Fails. When Prayer Fails. I wanted to take a minute and uh, say that the Adarmes family's adoption is complete. Where are you at, Alex Haley? Somewhere? Oh, in Children's Church. Get them adopted and get them working, right? <laughs> you know, when we get the opportunity to have seen Kaysen Foster Adarmes come into the family and become a permanent part, understand what we're all celebrating. We're celebrating a couple that heard about us from another couple that is now missionaries, came into our church, got baptized and spirit-filled, their whole lives changed, and God gave them a vision a vision of adopting children. And many years later, faithfully praying, fighting through lots of failure, lots of heartache, lots of criticism, they have their baby. Yeah. That is incredible. I mean, that is an extraordinary thing to, to point to another miracle in our midst. We see the Clements back here. We have a new graduate in the Clement family. We have Abriana Marie Clement. And listen, she actually spoke at her graduation. <laughs> uh, we have another announcement for you. There's life in the Stevens home. Judah and Sasha Stevens have an announcement to make. Judah. If you're new to LCM, this may seem strange to you. It's not strange to us. Uh, Judah's 20 years old. I, I was fortunate to watch him get married to a beautiful young woman, woman. And the Eregenas were my family beforehand because of the church. We've grown up together. When you look, the Clements and the Stevens have spent a decade together. The pastors in this fellowship, we've spent our entire lives together. I mean, from 15 or 16 years old on, we are a family. And ironically, that's what a church is supposed to be. Not a business, not, not a marketing entity. The truth is we hope you like us, but our mission doesn't depend upon you liking us. It never has. Our goal is to make sure that the Lord loves us Amen. and loves what we're doing. I wanted to talk to you today about when prayers fail for obvious reasons. We've fought through a lot of death here recently. We've fought through obstacle of every kind here recently. In the last 60 days, I know what it is to have unanimous decisions reversed. I mean, what the jury says simply doesn't matter. We know what it is to see our children die in our arms. We know what it is to see our dreams die in front of the whole world. And you know what? We're still here. And we're still going. And we will not stop. And it hasn't escaped our notice that from the moment that we entered into the Middle East for missions, all the fury of hell has been unleashed on us. And so I have a message for the devil and the rest of the world. We can take this and anything else that you send our way. There's a reason for that. The Almighty God is upholding us in our brokenness. Amen? Amen? Let's do this. Let's begin with a character sketch of Peter. Is that okay? We normally open our Bibles immediately, and we're going to open our Bibles. How many of you know LCM is a scripture-rich environment? You'll go through the Law, Prophets, Writings, Old and New Testament here. You'll leave with pages of further study. But I wanted to just talk to my family in a family-style meeting for just a minute. Peter is mentioned 176 times in the Newer Testament. To give you some perspective of what that means, that doesn't include his other names. That doesn't include the times that he's called Cephas. That doesn't include the times that he's called Simon. That only includes the actual word Peter. John, how many Johns are there in the Bible? John, son of Alphaeus, John, the brother of James. We, we have many Johns in the Bible. 
John is only mentioned 52 times in the Bible. Do you get an idea for Peter versus John in that regard? 176 verses 52. There are many Johns, and yet Peter's prominence in the Scripture dwarfs him. How about James? There are many James. James, the brother of Jesus, James the apostle, 42 times in the Scripture. It's hard to miss Peter's prominence among the 12. He stands out as if he was Yao Ming on a 7th grade basketball team. And yet, somehow or another, we miss the most important aspects in his life. Turn with me to Numbers 13. Let's put Numbers 13, 8 on the screen. I want to show you something that comes from Jewish history. It's a part of Jewish tradition. It's worked its way into our teaching. Numbers 13, 8 says, From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. When choosing the representatives that would go into the promised land and come back with a sample of what was in the promised land, Hoshea, son of Nun, was the representative of the tribe of Ephraim. Now skip down from Numbers 13, 8 to 13, 16. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. Moses changed the name of Hoshea to Joshua. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Sometimes God changes a man's name. Jacob goes to Israel. Abram goes to Abraham. Sarai goes to Sarah. Most of those name changes are extraordinary in their meaning. When we see Abram, the father of uh, many nations, go to Abraham, the, I'm sorry, Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, the father of the nations, or Sarai, which is something akin to drill sergeant, and she's given a name that is glorious. When we see these kind of name changes, it's hard not to take note, but very often they come from God. How many of you know that Solomon's given name was Jedediah. That's what God called him. Uh, it meant beloved of the Lord. That's not how he goes down in history, but that's how God referred to him. Very rarely does one man change another man's name. In fact, it takes a legal proceeding to do such things, which we saw this week in an adoption ceremony. Hoshea means salvation. Yahshua means Yahweh's salvation. Joshua is an extraordinary name. This begins a practice among the rabbis. Most rabbis would take up to 12 students. It turns out that one man pouring his life into 12 was about the ratio that God found acceptable. That when you went well beyond that, a 1 to 12 ratio, something got lost in the mix. That was the feeling. And they took among the 12... One special disciple, one special pupil called a Talmud who would take on leadership characteristics. What this means is that your rabbi would pick one student and use him as an example for the other students. Was that a good or bad thing? I guess it depends on whether or not the example is good or bad. One of the ways that rabbis through history designated their lead student is they gave them a nickname. So in this, we see 12 men gathered by Moses and one of them given a nickname. Go with me then to Matthew 10 and verse 2. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. How did Simon get the name Peter? You can read about that in Luke 6, 14 or Mark 3, 16. Jesus Christ gave Simon the name Peter because he was his lead disciple. The reason that I'm telling you this is when you look at the life of Peter, among the disciples, he was an example of somebody who was supposed to teach you how to be a good disciple. Does that make sense? Let me give you a few more examples, and perhaps this will help drive this home. Let's consider the leadership of Peter in the Scripture. When we do this, 
The principle that we're referring to with a lead disciple in Hebrew is called aha cham. Uh, it, it literally means the lead disciple. And to show you that that is what Peter is and then bring it into relevance, look at Luke 5, 8. Say there when you're there. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, those of you that are not entirely familiar with this context, let me help you with it. Peter's companions are all there. Peter has raised some objections to the suggestion of Jesus that they go out and fish some more. Peter's reaction when he realizes Jesus was right and all of the 12 were wrong was Peter boldly repents in front of all of his companions, even though they were all there. Tell me, is that not leadership? One man taking responsibility even though the entire group was wrong? This was because he was the hakam, a lead disciple. Look at John 6, verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Verse 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the, who did he ask? The 12. Read verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus is asking a question of 12 men, but only one man is answering the question. Is that not leadership? It's an incredible thing when you notice the number of times this occurs in the Scripture. For those of you that want to write them down, write down Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. This is where Jesus has got the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and he's asking, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And, of course, he asked the twelve by saying, but what about you, meaning you twelve, what do you say? And Peter's the one that answers. Over and over and over, the entire group is asked, and Peter is the one that answers. In Matthew 14, 26 through 29, this is the famous story that is usually painted uh, in churches somewhere. I, we may have it or may not. Uh, of the stormy sea with the boat. And all of the disciples are in the boat. But who gets out to go walk towards Jesus? What? what makes the other 11 content to sit back while the one goes? Because he's a leader, and they know it. You know, it's very comfortable sometimes to be one of the 11 who gets to sit in anonymity. You know, failures, private, successes you make public. That, that's a very easy position to be in. For Peter here is on display before the whole world regularly. What a, what a tough position. What an interesting position. How about Matthew 26, 40? All 12 men are present at Jesus' last hours on earth. All 12 are there. They're all sleeping, but Peter gets the question. Could you not watch with me? Wait with me for one hour? How are all 12 there, but Peter gets asked the question, not the others? Because he was a leader. John 18, 10. In John 18, 10, there are 12 men with Jesus. There are two swords among the 12 men. And Peter is the only one that takes any kind of action. He cuts off Malchus's ear. <laughs> not suggesting it's the right action. I'm simply saying 12 men are there, and it's not recorded that any of them did anything other than Peter. There were two swords there, but only one man wanted to act. In John 20, verses 3 through 8, Peter's the first to run to the tomb. In John 21, 7 through 11, Jesus has risen and is standing on the shore of Galilee, and John is talking with Peter, and they realize, wow, that's Jesus. Do you know what Peter does? 
He jumps into the water and swims to the shore. Do you know what the disciples did? Stayed in the boat and rowed to shore. Do you admire men like Peter? I mean, is that something to aspire to? The courage to act. Two people in here think it is. So does that make you one of the 11 or one of the 12? You know, it is an incredible thing how this country waits for its leaders to fall. It's as if somehow those who stand and try should be punished by those who sat and failed to try. Is that how Jesus treats you? Isn't that worth considering for a moment? Now, as leaders, it can be argued, and rightfully so, we should have a stricter judgment. James says this of teachers. Paul said to Timothy in the fifth chapter this of elders. But how do you learn to be a leader? The crushing failure of Peter is just as obvious as his attempts at success. It, I mean, when you think about it, almost every story that we've just mentioned actually ends up in failure. Turn with me to Mark 14 and verse 30. Say there when you were there. I said Mark and I meant Matthew. I'm sorry. I led everybody astray. A failure. We know that Peter showed leadership and he got out of the boat. But consider the weight of this crushing failure. In Matthew 14, 30, but when he saw the wind, he sank and was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, save me. Peter got out of the boat, amen. But the end of the story is he sank in front of the 11 who stayed in the boat. And then one of the men who was safely in the boat wrote it in the Word of God for all of us to read about for all time. We don't have a single story about Matthew's failure. But we know from reading Matthew's account all about Peter's failure. You could get the impression reading Acts that Peter and John were best friends, and they were. And John finds the need to write four times in one chapter that he outran Peter to the tomb. <laughs> Peter left first, but I outran him. Did I mention that I outran him? Um, I was the first to arrive upon the scene, but, but then Peter came and went. And, yeah, John, we got it, man. You're faster than Peter. We, we, we got it. Sometimes we glory in failure, and it's almost as if we glory in the exposure of others' failure while forgetting we have unexposed failure. Do you hate everybody else's sin and privately nurture your own? I have weaknesses. I have shortcomings. I have small failings. How could he sin? Yes. For him, it's sin. For you, you know, it's, a, it's an oversight, a misunderstanding. Look, one thing that you learn watching the life of Peter is that anybody who tries is going to fail so. Oh, my goodness. The more that you look at these kind of things, you can see it in Matthew 16, 22 through 23. He has just gotten... At Caesarea Philippi, he has just gotten the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, and he's blessed. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father who is in heaven. This, you're a rock, and on this rock I'm going to build the church. The height of success followed by this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is after hearing that Jesus would be crucified. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Peter's suggestion was publicly rebuked 
and his best friends attributed his words to the devil himself. Have you ever had to live under that kind of scrutiny? It's an incredible pressure. And it was right. Jesus Christ did this because it was right to do. But it's a poor, timid soul that never gets in the ring. At least Peter was trying. At least he was getting out there. At least you have his successes and failures to read about rather than the anonymity of the masses. Isn't that... I grew up in Louisiana. I watched a man crucified publicly, verbally and every other way, for decades, for doing something that I know good and well, many pastors have done in their hearts, minds, and definitely on their computers, weekly. It's an interesting thing how Christians handle failure. We want to handle failure as the Bible teaches us to handle failure. Think on John 13, 8. In John 13, 8, we're in the last day of Jesus' life. Jesus wants to wash Peter's feet. Peter doesn't understand. I know you understand everything the Lord tells you to do, but Peter didn't. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Now, let's start to put these together, okay? He's been rebuked in front of the whole world and called Satan on the same day that he got the revelation of who Jesus is. Shortly thereafter, he sinks while he's trying to walk to Jesus. And what's written about? His sinking. What's remembered? His sinking. In Matthew 26, 40 through 43, all 12 are sleeping, but Peter is the one that is rebuked for sleeping. I mean, he slept through Jesus' most pressing time. You get to read about Peter's failure during Jesus' most pressing time, pressing time while drinking a latte. It's like you're just flipping through the newspaper reading about the destruction of someone's life. Do you know what that was like for him? To realize in the days to come what he had done? Well, when Judas realized what he had done, what did Judas do? As a church, we do not want to be harsh. As a church, we have no interest in punishing failure or punishing mistakes. We have an interest in people acknowledging their failure so that they can grow from it, move on to much better things. It should be no Christian's desire to hang a scarlet letter around someone's neck, ever. Because what should be around your neck if you do that? I won't embarrass any of you, but do you really think that I can't ask you a question publicly that you would be tempted to lie about? It's an interesting thing how the church can be at times. In John 18, 10, we already know that Peter struck with a sword. Jesus put Malchus's ear back on. So Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, and Jesus puts it back on. I promise I'm going somewhere with that. Hang on to this thought for a second. In the last three events, we've gone from the last meal that Jesus has with his disciples, Peter is rebuked and told that he'll have no part in the ministry. The last prayer time that Jesus has with his disciples, Peter is publicly rebuked while they're all guilty sitting there. And in the last second before Jesus is taken away, Peter's actions are repudiated and he's rebuked. What does it feel like to be Peter? To not be able to get anything right? to have been deceived in sin so that your actions are wrong. What does that feel like? Well, I'm pretty sure that you would know. Unless, as the psalmist says, you flattered yourself too much to detect your own sin. 
This is why the Bible warns us about how we deal with those who are in sin. It's why we're told to go privately, to then go with a brother, to then, if you cannot get somebody to listen any other way, see if they will listen to the church. The point is to get them to listen, not to expose their horrible deed. See, the church is about restoration. And you expose something only for the purpose of restoration. Wow, well, can you hear me today? Yes. I've been pastoring now for 20 years. I have grandchildren, and I'm standing among my family, and you know what these last few months have like. I'm, I'm pleading with you as your friend. No Christian can take any other attitude than this. We are intolerant of sin, but we are looking for sinners to repent. We are looking... We are not holding things over their head. We cannot wait for them to turn. The heaviest of all discipline listed in the Scripture is for those who will not acknowledge their sin. The message here is pretty clear. When you fail, let's look at one more of Peter's failures for a minute. In John 18, does Peter deny Jesus three times? Does he do it with a curse one of the times he denies? How embarrassing. One of the people that he's denying Jesus to is a relative of the man who Peter assaulted with a sword. You know, it, it is hilarious. I was in another town at one time, and there was a woman who had walked rightly with the Lord, was now not walking rightly with the Lord, would not admit it, I had moved 400 miles away. I stopped back in the previous town. I walk into a restaurant, and who am I staring at 400 miles away? Don't think the Lord won't find you out. But he doesn't search you out to hurt you. He searches you out to restore you. While we're thinking about this, you should probably remember that in Matthew 26, 35, let's put that one on the screen and everybody turn to it. Before Peter had denied Jesus three times, within hours earlier, Peter had self-confidently said, but Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Do you catch that last part? Is anybody in here Catch the irony in this statement. Who denied Jesus three times? Peter. All of the disciples said that they would never disown Jesus. How many of them didn't run when uh, he was arrested? How many of them were at the foot of the cross? How many of them actually held true to this? Is that incredible? But you've never considered that the other ten did exactly what Peter did, did you? You know why? Because they were safely in anonymity. It's an incredible thing how we can watch somebody else judge for their sin while sitting in ours and not move and not speak and be sure that we're doing the right thing. You know what's the right thing? When everybody's tearing their garments, everybody's putting ashes on their forehead because we all are culpable. I love this body. I have more respect for the leaders in this church and the elders in this church than any that I've ever been a part of anywhere. They are my friends, they are my peers, and I am totally submitted to them. I hope that's evident to the entire world at this point. You're my family. This church is about restoration. There's only one group of people that we are not interested in restoring, and that's those that will not acknowledge their failure. They will not admit their sin. Take care to make sure you're not in that group. Failure should be our teacher. It's never our undertaker. Say that with me. Failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Failure is delay. It's not defeat. 
Failure is a temporary station, not your permanent status. Failure is the leader's inevitable price for trying to accomplish something. You know, we love to hear that so-and-so patented a process. I was talking with a man who happens to be a dentist just the other day. And the medical field's always fascinated me. When you're thinking about medical procedures that exist today, like I remember seeing a Lizaroff fixator. These are halo rings that uh, are used to help with compound fractures. There's a pressure put upon the bones because bone only responds to, dense, to it only forms density in response to pressure. So when somebody's had a bad enough break and you went to heal, you need those bones to kind of rub together. And so they put these fixator rings down this guy's leg. And while we were waiting for the surgery, they held out that leg, took a Sharpie marker, and wrote on the leg that they're gonna operate on. All I could think about was what precipitated this practice. <laughs> Whose leg did they put the fixator on that was the wrong leg? We love to read. We love to talk about so-and-so innovated this process. What you don't know is about how many people failed before we had that successful procedure. Failure is a necessary part of life. I, I wish that we learned through our successes, but we do not. I got to tell you, God's hand in my life in this week has been a teaching hand. He loves our family. He loves your family. So he allows painful events into your life because they teach us. They don't kill us. Let's read Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Say there when you are there. Are y'all doing okay this morning? Yeah. Are you heavy? Are you Look, Justin's mine. Y'all see that? <laughs> if that doesn't light up your life, something's wrong with you. Repent. Amen. And ladies, I want you to know he's still single. <laughs> it blows our mind. We don't understand it. We think it has something to do with the fact that he's more devoted to Jesus than anything else. Yeah. So if you want a man like that, you're going to have to get so lost in Jesus that that's where he found you. Are you guys in Acts? Churches like this are dangerous. I know your names. In Acts 5, chapter 12, the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Do you mean to tell me that the most rebuked man in the New Testament was so restored that his shadow healed people? It may be that the level of success that you enjoy in your life is directly proportional to the amount of failure that you have personally felt. Because when you have failed as publicly and as often and as bitterly as Peter did, and your shadow heals somebody, you would never think that it was you. Because you remember the day that you sank. You remember the day that you denied Jesus. You remember the day you were rebuked in front of all of your friends. When you view failure in that light, you see why it's the inevitable price of success. Not only do you fail while you are trying to achieve, because you failed, you can be trusted with the achievement. I don't want to be a pastor who just tells you stories, and I have very serious things to get at in the Word. But one of my favorite people in the world is Winston Churchill. And I got the chance to speak at a graduation just yesterday. And I was reminded of the time when Winston was asked after World War II to come across the channel 
make the small trip across the pond and speak at a commencement ceremony. And after traveling a 12-hour by jet, I don't know in his day uh, how long that took, he stood behind the podium and spoke for less than 30 seconds. Some said that he was drunk. He did drink, but I don't think he was drunk on this occasion. He had one message for them. He said, never, never, never give up. And then he turned around and walked away. By the way, I told you he did like to drink. He, uh, he was at a party, and a woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are drunk. He said, Yes, madam, this is true. And in the morning I shall be sober, but you will still be ugly. <laughs> she said, Sir, if I were your wife, I would poison you. He said, Yes, madam, and if I were your husband, I would gladly drink that poison. <laughs> he had a peculiar wit. But of all the things that he said, my favorite that he said, and I can talk about Winston Churchill all day long. I'd rather talk about Jesus Christ. But if Winston says something that is true, then it's true. And he said, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Can we get an amen to the courage to continue? As a body, we are not going to be the kind of people that cannibalize each other. What we're going to do is we're going to reach down and pick up. That's what we're going to do because that's what our God does. He looks and sees people crying out in their misery and slavery in Egypt, and he reaches down to raise them up, and all of them were imperfect, even the men that he used to bring them out. In fact, the man who birthed the Levitical priesthood often had no spine. It's an incredible thing how God can get perfect results from imperfect people. We need to decide that our God is bigger than the mistakes that we make. While we're on that subject, it turns out that Peter got to write his own book. And having written his own book and a copy been preserved for us, in five chapters of Peter's book, we have five life lessons. Would you like to learn them? Let us go to 1 Peter, and I'm going to read to you from the first chapter, the 8th and the ninth verse. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter knew what it was like to be in a situation where he couldn't see Jesus in it anywhere. I mean, after all, when he was in that courtyard warming himself and Jesus was on trial, he can't quite see Jesus as Messiah and dying. Do you understand? Have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't figure out how Jesus was involved in this at all? Wow. Two of 200. What about the rest of you? You can speak to me today. I'm certainly going to speak to you. Have you ever been in a situation it was hard to tell what God was doing? Yes. Hey Amen. You are awake. From Peter, we learn in this scenario that you're already receiving the salvation of your souls. In other words, in the midst of situations where he didn't know what God was doing, do you know what he had? He had an eternal perspective. He understood that this was not the end, that heaven was watching, that you are receiving a kingdom, that you're in the process of it. How many of you have heard the old expression of, be patient, God's not through with me yet? Yeah, how many of you have only applied that to your own life and are begrudgingly applying it to someone else's life? Have you ever read James 2.13, his mercy triumphs over his judgment? Look. It's not that we are incapable of pointing out sin. We are to point out sin. I do it all of the time. You know that. It's that the goal is not degradation and humiliation. The goal is that we expose sin so that people will turn from it. That is the goal. Because the man who sits trapped in his sin is dying and doesn't know it. His real failure is his failure to admit the failure. Once he admitted the failure, he's already on the road to recovery. We 
We may have to get on the road to recovery, amen? amen. I don't want to sit in failure. I was remarking with Pastor Sutherland, because Pastor Sutherland and Pastor Wade, they're good men. They're better men than I am. They always have been. Matthew's handsome, Wade's smart. I'm just fat. He spent his life in education. And I know he's familiar with what an A is. I know that. I've seen them. They're like unicorns. I've heard of them. I know that they exist. I can describe one, but I've never personally held one in my hands. Pastor Matthew knew what a B was. I know that what comes below a B is a C, and what becomes below that is a D. And then comes an F. Isn't an F an ugly thing? What's F stand for? Fail. Fail. But does it? If F stands for fail, then what does an A stand for? What was that? What's B stand for? C. You, you, you got me? D. And why do we skip E to get to F? All right, teenagers, just come home and say, Mom, I don't know what to tell you. I didn't exactly make an F, and I didn't. I was kind of in the E category. <laughs> it's acceptable. Not acceptable. Acceptable. <laughs> when you figure out the difference between those two words, you'll no longer be making E's. Could it be that we fear failure as a society so much? that we have three categories that have no acrostic acronym and one category that the whole world knows, that's a failure! Could it, could it be that? Now, I don't want to change our grading system. They're monkeying around with our school system so much, it's not a school system. Maybe monkey was the right word. It's a monkey system. But I do know this. I know that today's mistake does not have to define your tomorrow. I know that the man who is credited with doubting Jesus Christ's resurrection, doubting Thomas. Everybody, raise your hand if you know who doubting Thomas is. Now raise your other hand. You're no longer Baptist. Was that a mistake? I know that the man called Doubting Thomas is the first man in all of the Scripture to have acknowledged Jesus as both Lord and God. And I know that very few people know that, but everybody seems to know he's Doubting Thomas. In the body of Christ, our failures do not define us. I think the reason that we love the Apostle Paul is because every failure that he had that is listed was prior to salvation. I think the reason we shy away from Peter is twofold. We're not Catholic. Neither was Peter. And secondly, we don't like the amount of failure that is in his life after falling in love with Jesus. It makes us uncomfortable. We want our leaders perfect, and we reject them as soon as we find out that they're not. Peter teaches us to have an eternal perspective. Eternal perspective is everything. Oh, young people, listen to me for a second. And by saying young people, I really mean all those old people, okay? But it's easier. In this country, you can get away with addressing direct, harsh statements to young people and hoping that the old people hear it. When you're sitting in a situation that feels hopeless, when you think that nothing will make it any better, you remember that there's an eternity at hand. It's not today. It's an eternity. Every serious mistake that somebody makes in their life is when they lose track of eternity. They think that today is what matters. This hour is what matters. Eternity is what matters. And your eternity is not defined by one moment. One good moment or one bad moment. That's why this faith walk is called a walk. In 1 Peter 2, the second chapter... 1 Peter 2, 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by them you may grow up in your salvation. Somebody say, grow up. Grow up. 
If you are growing up in your salvation, do you know what that means about a mistake today? Tomorrow you've outgrown today's mistake. Peter is an old man writing this, and he knew what it was to grow. All right, now let's talk to the old people in the room. We talk to the young people. How many of you, let's just talk to those who are 40 and up. They think that's old. 40 and up. How many of you would like to possess the knowledge that you know now at 20 years old? How many mistakes would it have avoided? Of course, you wouldn't know it if you didn't make those mistakes, would you? Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up. Do you know what it means that you get to grow? It means that today's failure can be outgrown tomorrow. Oh, that is such good news. Yeah, if, if you knew the crushing way to failure, you would know that the opportunity to grow is everything. This is what keeps your failure from defining you. You can outgrow it. You can get better than it. You can become bigger than it. In fact, you can swallow it up altogether. Amen. Growing is everything. That's true professionally. That's true personally. It's true spiritually. There's no way in which this is not true. And people that already see themselves as fully grown are damning themselves to their state of existence. They can't acknowledge their sin. They can't see their immaturity. If all of you were walking outside one at a time, and everybody else in the room was already in the parking lot. And somebody's wearing beautiful heels like Mandy. When Mandy trips off of that curb and falls flat on her face, what is the first thing that she does? <laughs> she hits the ground. Who saw that? <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Which one of you, when you fall in public, when you slip in Walmart, doesn't look around to see who saw what just happened? Don't tell me fear of failure is not driving you. I know that it is. I know that it is. We want people to think well of us. Sometimes we present ourselves better than we actually are. The one thing that we do not want is for failure to define us. Do you know that you will be judged by the standard that you use? Mercy is the currency of the kingdom. It's the currency of the kingdom. And the reason that it's the currency of the kingdom is because all of us are equally filthy. We're being made righteous. We are receiving the goal of our salvation. It's not that you don't have the ability to judge or point out sin. You must as a Christian. You must. You cannot tolerate it. Exercise it. Cut it out. Get rid of it. And it never defines the man who is continuing in Christ. Ever. One of the real difficulties in dealing with these things as a church is everybody says they continue in Christ, but very few actually do. So we've learned to say we're sorry and we're not really sorry. And it's developed a kind of attitude that says we'll wait and see. I understand that. I preach it. I do it. First keep first, go produce fruit in keeping with repentance is, is a common saying, and it's a right saying. You have to do that. And let us never grow skeptical that the person we've said that to will do it. Because we're for their restoration. Amen? In the third chapter of Peter, y'all still okay? Yeah. I haven't put you to sleep, have I? Because we hadn't even talked about when your prayer is not answered, but we're going to. In 1 Peter 3, verse 13, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be fooled. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. The Christian's life is supposed to be devoid and free of the fear of failure. 
A relationship with the Lord is not designed on an I gotcha system. Remember that you were a sinner when he got you. You were damaged goods when he found you. He's not waiting for you to become imperfect so that he can smack you around. He knows that you're imperfect and he's working to perfect you. That is the goal of all church discipline, to perfect the sinner, to bring righteousness to their lives, to help them. And the people who are doing it also happen to be as flawed as me, which means that while trying to help them, you have to make sure that you don't get it wrong. Is that incredible? What a task. Who is up to such a task? The Spirit of God is. The Word of God is. That's why we must be led by the Word. It's why we must be filled with His Spirit. In the fourth chapter, 1 Peter 4, 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. The best thing that I could tell you Peter learned, starting at the beginning, he's in an eternal situation. He's growing. His relationship with the Lord is not based on fear and rejection. And in the fourth chapter, we find out you have to die to sin. Since failure is not what is driving you, you have to die to sin. You have to die to evil desires. You have to. Your earthly life cannot be based on evil human desires. You have to live for the will of God. This is not an excuse that says it doesn't matter how much you sin. This is not a license for immorality. This kind of failure we're speaking about It's the kind that's recoverable because you know it's failure. The man who's living his life for evil, earthly, human desires has already deceived himself into thinking that it's okay. And then he moved into willful sin. And then he moved into great transgression. That's how that works. But the person who is broken over their sin, it simply becomes a learning experience. Let's go to chapter 5. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Man, this is one of my favorite lessons from Peter. He put it last in his letter. If you can walk humbly through your failures and your successes... If you can recognize that you're under God's hand and any good thing that you've done is under God's hand, any bad thing that you have done, it's under his hand, then you know something is true. Your situation is going to change. Your situation is going to change. Say that with me. Your situation is going to change. Do you know what the sign on this building says? Life-changing ministries. Today's mistake will not define your future in here. What will define your future in here is the courage to continue in Christ. We will not turn away from any man that is running after Christ. This is life-changing ministries. Do you know what this means for those of you with hidden failures? They don't have to define you. Do you know what this means for those of you that have properly dealt with your failures? They're actually successes now because you've learned another way that you do not want to go. I'd like to read to you from 1 John 4. Say there when you're there, 1 John 4. We're going to pick up in verse 16. Titus is there. You know, I got a grandson named Titus. I got one named Elijah. I have no idea what the next one will be named. Just like God, that within 30 days of losing a child, holding the dead baby in our arms, we get another grandchild. It's just like him. Y'all, we can't lose. Every single failure is the breeding ground for tomorrow's success. You just don't know it. 
The Lord is so good to us. He provides encouragement everywhere we look. Make sure that you are walking in the spirit of the Lord with each other. In 1 John 4, beginning in verse 16, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. I want to comment on that before we even read the rest of it. We know and rely on the love God has for us. Did I get that right? See, when your love for God is in question, because if you don't walk as he walked, the Bible says you don't love him. So when your love is in question, when you have sullied your reputation, when you have messed up your life of love towards him, what do you rely on? His love for you. When you cannot be sure that you love him, you can be sure that he loves you. By the way, why do we love him according to 1 John? Because he first loved us. So where is the place for restoration to start? Knowing that God loves you. When you are incapable of loving him, he shows you how to do it by loving you. In your worst situation, he loves you. Romans 5, 6 teaches this so clearly. That's why we put it as today's scripture. You were a sinner when he found you. When you don't know what else to do, when you are broken by your own failure, when you love the Lord enough to be so crushed by what you've done that you're not sure you love the Lord. It's an interesting dichotomy, isn't it? You have to be sure that he loves you. Do you know another way to say that? It's from Hebrews eleven six. 6. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Exist where? Exist in the middle of your situation. See, if you're going to please him, you're going to have to start with he's involved in this somehow. And he still loves me as long as I will reciprocate that to him. So when you see someone trying to get right, help him get right. How many of you need to get right today? Surely we can't let our children set the example of repentance for us. How guilty must we be if we sit in our seat while young people confess things that the old people are doing and are going unconfessed? One of the things that I love about 1 John 416 is it teaches us where the emphasis is and so we know and rely on the love God has for us God is love whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him verse 17 in this way love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence say confidence confidence, confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him there is no fear in love. I want you to understand something. If people are not absolutely confident that you love them and God loves them, why would they ever tell you about their failure? And if they can't tell you about it, aren't they going to be trapped in it? And what is the outcome if they're trapped in it? There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. We do not punish sin. We expose it for the purpose of restoration, but we never punish it. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. One more verse. We love because he first loved us. When you know of his love for you, you are compelled to respond to that love. That's what the gospel is. When you know how he loves you, it gives you the chance to respond to him. Now, you know this story. In John 18, Peter denied Jesus three times. Is that true? In John 21, how was he restored? Three times Jesus asked him, do you love me? Three times. 
Now that love would be carried out over the rest of Peter's life by feeding the sheep. He would show Jesus he loved him by what he did. But three times Jesus asked him, and when Peter got to the third time, he was hurt. But you know what? At some point he recognized that as many times as he denied he even knew the man's name, he also had pledged to love him. He knew that Jesus loved him, and he was being restored as he was learning to give that love back. Isn't that how the gospel works? We love because he first loved us. The goal of the Christian life is to see people reconciled to God. All of them are failures. Everyone. There is no such thing as somebody who is not failing outside of Christ. But what happens is you find out he loves you in the midst of your failure. And that makes you want to love him. So your failure becomes your first successful day in your life. The tough plowing that feels like failure becomes a fruitful harvest. The bitter battle becomes a sweet victory. The tough storm becomes the beautiful calm afterwards. Failures don't define us what we do in our failures. That's what defines us. Your successes are not final. Your failures are not fatal. Courage to continue is what counts. The day that Jesus was crucified, there was another death in a manner of speaking. Peter had already left everything that he had to follow Jesus. He had already spent three years with Jesus. He loved Jesus but he had so little of the character of Jesus in him, so little of the spirit of Jesus in him. Man, could that be where many of you are today? You love Jesus, you're identified with Jesus, but there's so little of Jesus-like qualities in you. How low was Peter during those three days? How crucified was Peter emotionally while Christ was being crucified physically. Do you think Peter knew what poverty of spirit was? Do you think Peter knew what it was to be broken and contrite? Is this the moment when Peter became a sinner that needed to be saved? It's kind of, and it's kind of not. Do you know why? He had already been a sinner who needed to be saved. He just found out he still needed to be saved. See, salvation is an ongoing process. That's why failure is not fatal, because he didn't just save you from your last failure. He's promised to save you from your next. You know what that means? You don't have to live life afraid. You don't have to be scared that you're going to trip and everybody's going to see it. You can lead boldly. You can get out of the boat and try to walk on the water. You can proclaim Jesus' name among foreign gods. You can stand your ground, and if you fall... He will pick you back up. Oh, God, I love him. If this was based on him giving me a brand new life, and then if I ever sullied that life again, it would be over, none of you would be here with me. We're very fond of giving our testimony, the wretched man that I was, and then I became a new man, and all of that is true. And I tell it all the time. What I don't often tell you is how wretched I still am at times. Oh, how our leaders, we love to hold up an image of righteousness. If you have an image of righteousness, it's only because Jesus helped you get it. And don't you think for a minute that he can't take his hand off and watch you fall to teach you a lesson. Can I tell you just a little sleep? A little slumber, a little folding of the hands. And as Jeremiah said in the fourth chapter of Lamentations in the first verse, the gold will lose its luster. You have no idea how fragile your existence is. It is based on the love God has for you. It is not based on your perfection. Because he loves us, we want to be perfected by him. We boldly face our failures. We boldly stand up and say, I sinned. At least some of us do.
I'm not scared to stand up and say when I sin because that's how I first met him. It's when I stood up and said I sin. And I find out he still meets me every time I stand up and say that I sin. This is why your humiliation is your exaltation. And your exaltation is your humiliation. The man that can humble himself and say, I'm failing miserably, is met by Christ. And the man who sees himself as a wild success is far from Christ. Will you turn with me to 1 Kings 19? I hope that we're encouraging some of you. I equally hope I'm offending some of you. There is scarcely a greater man in all of the Bible than Elijah. I love him. Elijah had some panache, some chutzpah, some matzi, whatever that means to you. Elijah has just stood on Mount Carmel, overlooking the Jezreel Valley, and he has been answered from heaven with fire and water. He has put to death more than 700 false prophets, and he has faced down a king. And he did it while taunting the false prophets. Cut yourself. Shout louder. Maybe your God can't hear you. I know, Elijah said. He's on the body. I'm not making it up. You should learn to read Hebrew. It's enlightening. <laughs> Elijah was bold. But that's not the Elijah that we read about in 1 Kings 19. After the height of his success, do you know where he was? He was in the Valley of Humiliation. For him, failure had caused the gold to lose its luster. For him... The depths of despair were defeating his very soul. In verse 1, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid. And ran for his life. How does the man who faced down the king, faced down the false prophets, run for his life from one crazy woman? Depends on the crazy woman, I guess. Should have grown up in the house that I did. I'd a lot rather fought with a man than my sister or my mother. The great prophet the mercenary of Almighty God. The prophet who calls fire from the skies, who can call drought or alleviate drought, is running from a woman. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. When you run from God, when you're hurt, where do you run? Because Beersheba was the place that Abraham had found a well. A well that he marked with a tamarisk tree. A well where he killed seven perfect ewe lambs, a unique sacrifice in history. A well that would be marked for all time, a life-saving well. Elijah may not have known what to do, but he knew where to run. He came to a broom tree. How many of you bought a broom? Elijah about to clean that ignorance up. He came to a broom, broom tree and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I'm reading the fourth verse. I have had enough. 
take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Does it sound like he's a little down with failure? Does it sound like he's a little beat up? Does it sound like he's come to the conclusion that he's as bad of a failure as the failures that came before him? Man, if you can't relate to that, you've never ventured to even try. The only thing that I despise more than the failures of my mentors is when I repeat them. The very thing that I hate. It's incredible the weight that the devil can put on a human being and the extent to which you can believe the lie. The greatest prophet that the Older Testament ever saw up to this point wants to die. He is praying that God will take his life. Is that pretty low? Yeah. Turn with me to 2 Kings. In 2 Kings, the second chapter. What has happened since Elijah's prayer to die is God has sent him to pull down rulers of nations and to raise up rulers of nations. And he has raised up for Elijah a successor named Elisha. Say successor. successor. Boy, we like that word. It's related to success, not failure, isn't it? Out of Elijah's failure, something happens. God directs him towards setting the national stage. God directs him towards something very specific, raising up a prophet like him who did exactly twice as many miracles as he ever did in his life. What does success look like? Your perfect life? Or lives that come after you that surpass you. What does success look like? Is your life about you? Because that sounds like failure. Or is your life about them? Because that's what success looks like. To be of any use to them, you first have to admit your failure. And ask the Lord to help you. And then something happens. Look what happens here in verse 10. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours otherwise not. As they were talking and walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind and Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw them no more. Consider what has happened here. Elijah was so discouraged by his failure, he wanted to die. And he asked God to kill him. In his failure, he prayed. In his prayer failed. Because not only did God not kill him, God never let this man taste death. He took him into the heavens alive. And the Jewish nation and the Christian people that understand their Bible still wait for Elijah's return to finish his work before the great day of the Lord. He's one of the two end times prophets of Revelation 11. He shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus to talk about their work. He was not a failure. He just failed to see his coming success. He had no idea what God had for him tomorrow. We serve a God who will not answer your prayer that says, I'm a failure, let me just be a failure, give up on me. If he has to come in a chariot of fire and take you into his presence, he takes you into the heavens alive, not dead. He is not a victor conquering God like the God of Islam that stomps you into ground and controls you through fear. He is the loving God of Israel who comes 
comes to rescue you and give you life and life abundantly, he will not define you by your failure. Amen. He'll define you by your continuance in Christ. I remind you as Matthew is coming to the stage of the separation of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. Jesus is there on the throne. All the glorious angels are with him. The heavenly host is there. He gathers the nations to him and he begins to separate them. Some he puts on his right, some he puts on his left. All of our real problems have always come from the left. It's the easy way to remember the scripture. Those that are on his right, he says, you come into my presence. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. When, when did we do that? You did it when you did it for the least of these. Those that were on his left, he said, you're going to depart into the fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels because you did not do these things. Strange text to end with, I know. They were not banished to hell because of the mistakes they made. They were banished to hell because they refused to try to do what God had told them to do. There is not one person in that scenario that is corrected because they tried and didn't do it well or they tried to do it and it didn't work. The only people that are sent into the eternal flames are the ones that refuse to try. Oh, man, we cannot be a church that punishes people who try. We have to be a church that steers people who are trying. We have to. To do that, we need to correctly see what is and is not failure. We need to correctly see and point out sin. But when we see hearts that are trying to turn from their sin, help them turn. Don't hang them with it. Now you're going to have an opportunity. Have you watched others be more courageous than yourself? Are you the 11 that are in the boat? Does everybody else make every mistake because you don't do anything at all? Are you Captain Courageous sitting in the company of the quiet? I was sitting listening to a couple old guys in a cigar shop because I love cigars. And they're all the heroes of their own stories. It's incredible. They were all the best athletes. They walk to school uphill both ways in the snow with a bobcat on their back. I've been there for many hours. And I can sometimes be just a little bit skeptical. And it occurred to me that the men that were sharing their glory stories had never actually been in a battle. And I, can, I knew it. They were simply entertaining each other with their lies. Anybody who has ever been in a real contest knows what failure is. You may only have a chance once or twice in your life to do something that is truly courageous, but every day you have a chance not to be a coward. Right now, I'm praying that the courageous spirit of Christ would move upon you for one reason and one reason only, to be able to acknowledge your failure and move on from it, to move into restoration. But if you sit and pretend that you are the perfection and the model of wisdom, on the mountain of God, among the fiery stones, then you sound like another one that we all know is guilty. Could you stand to your feet?